Um, we're conducting these as public meetings, so this will be posted to our YouTube page uh, in accordance with public meeting law. Thanks, Guthrie. I'm going to go ahead and get us started on behalf of Caraccio oh. Group. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Thank you all for yep. your time today. Um, as you know, the HEC is developing its next strategic plan. We're conducting these focus groups as well as a survey and interviews to gather input to inform the plan. This is a public meeting and we'll, we are recording this conversation. We'll be monitoring the chat, but we highly encourage participants to express their input verbally to ensure that we capture your feedback accurately. Uh, we may use quotes uh, for our final report. However, they will not be attributed to any one individual. Uh, we ask for your candor and ask that you help us create an environment where everyone can share their perspective. And to that end, there are three agreements we'd like to ask everyone to commit to. And I am going to quickly post these in the chat. Oh, or Colleen is going to post them in the chat. Um, step up, step back, uh, speak up, and also create space for others. Be aware of how often and how much you are speaking. We won't likely be able to hear from every person on every question. You can always use the chat to share as well. Both Colleen and I will be monitoring that. Uh, allow for different perspectives. We expect that there will be different perspectives. Be open and curious and take this as an opportunity to learn about others' experience that may differ from your own. And be bold. We will ask about big questions and challenges facing higher education in Oregon. This is a great form to think big and be bold in your answers. Uh, can everyone agree to these agreements? Just give me a quick show of thumbs if you feel like you can move into them. All right, thank you everyone. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Okay. Um, you know, we've got an hour scheduled for this. If you need to take care of yourself and take a break, uh, feel free to do what you need to do for your own self-care. So we're going to spend a few minutes doing introductions, and I am going to uh, quickly pose, put in the chat also what we'd like to hear from everyone, uh, your name, pronouns, uh, the role if you're affiliated with an organization, and your relationship to the HEC. And I am going to go ahead and call on folks if that's okay. So let's start with President Howard. Do you mind with going first and getting us started? No problem. Uh, my name is Jessica Howard. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the president of Chemeketa Community College, which is one of the 17 community colleges that the, the HEC helps to coordinate. Thank you, President Howard. President Peters, do you mind going next? Sure, and I'm not sure if my camera's working. Can you see me? Oh, great. Yes, okay. uh, uh, Jesse Peters, he, him, pronouns. I'm the president of Western Oregon University. And similarly, I work with the HEC who coordinates the public institutions. And there are seven public institutions of four years in uh, Oregon. Thank you, President Peters. Senator Dembro, would you go next? Sure. I'm Michael Dembro, he, him. <clears throat> I'm the senator for District 23 which is much of Northeast, Southeast Portland. I chair the Senate Committee on Education and so spend a lot of time um, giving assignments to the heck that they probably don't want to be receiving. But um, no, I, I was also, um, when the heck was formed, I was the chair of the House Higher Education Committee and had a lot to do with the creation of it. Thank you, Senator Denbro. Duncan Wise, would you go next? You're on mute, Duncan. Duncan, you're on mute. Thank you, Senator. Um, Duncan Wise, uh, he, him, Oregon Business Council president, and uh, one of the first, I joined the inaugural group on the HEC, so I served on the HEC for eight years. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Melissa Mason, would you go next? Hello, Melissa Mason. Um, she and her for pronouns. I'm also the executive director of Tangled Ends Hair Academy 
and have been working with the HEC for quite some time. Um, I also chair the Private Career Schools Advisory Board. Thank you, Melissa. And David Gerstenfeld. Hi, everyone. David Gerstenfeld. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the director at the Oregon Employment Department, and we work with HEC in two primary areas. We're very closely involved with our Office of Workforce Investment, uh, working on kind of career development and aligning um, students with career opportunities and jobs. And somewhat related to that, our labor market information research shop is part of the, or the Oregon Longitudinal Data Collaborative at HEC that uses cross-agency data to try to inform policymakers about policies to help get people on the right career paths. Thank you, David. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Susan Karaski. I'm a consultant with Caraggio Group. I have been working with Caraggio Group for coming up on 10 years now. I do a lot of uh, strategic planning, large scale systems change, organizational change. My, um, although I haven't directly worked with the HEC, I did do a couple of projects for the Continuous Improvement Committee of WorkSource Oregon, of which the HEC is affiliated. So very excited to be here with you today. Uh, Colleen, do you mind uh, briefly introducing yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Colleen Floyd. I'm an associate principal with Caraggio Group, um, and I have been the project manager for this strategic planning work. It's good to see you all. Thanks, Colleen. Yes, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a couple of quick technology things. I think you're all familiar with Teams, uh, and you're all doing a great job of this. You could just use the mute when you're not talking. If you have something to say, you can use the raise hand feature. It is at should be at the top of your toolbar next in between your people and your react functions. Um, and that'll help me make sure that I am uh, calling on folks in the order that I see. So we're going to start uh, with our first question for you all. Um, from your perspective, and Colleen's going to put this in the chat too, so you have it for reference. From your perspective, what impact should the heck have on Oregon? I'd like to get a start. Duncan. Uh, well, I think the heck is really at the center of creating the vision for post-secondary access and to develop a strategy to ensure that all Oregonians have equitable access to opportunities in areas of their interest, whether it's um, trades, um, two-year degrees, four-year degrees and beyond. And it, it should be the center of that conversation and it should have a funding and governance strategy to assure that that happens. Um, working with its partners, including the legislature and the governor and, and the many, many players involved. But it, in my mind, um, it's right at the heart of the talent development strategy for Oregon. Thank you, President Wise. Appreciate that. Senator Dembro. Sure. Um, yeah, I would echo what Duncan said. You know, one of the real the benefits of the HEC is its comprehensive nature, you know, that is coordinating colleges, universities, workforce, um, you know, public, private, um, which is actually quite unique uh, in this, in the country, uh, an entity that brings together all of those, um, all of those sectors. And so, you know, I think it's, um, it plays a, a very central role whose goal has to be to remove barriers uh, to people taking that next step um, to coming into advanced training wherever wherever they are in their career continuum and uh, making it as easy as possible for them to move uh, from one step to the next and to um, actually you know, not only remove barriers, but create incentives for them to do so. Thank you, Senator Denbrook. Uh, President Howard. 
Uh, yes, um, I would echo what's already been said, but uh, you know, I think the word coordinating in my mind is um, incredibly important because we don't have a system with a capital S. And so we have lots of inefficiencies and lack of um, sometimes incentives to work together, a lot of local control, which uh, is not a bad thing, but uh, I come from another state where there's a very strong higher education coordinating commission type structure. And um, so for me, access is a, uh, has a lot to do with pathways between institutions. And I would say um, that is one of the biggest um, needs that I think the HEC uh, steps up to try to fill is making sense of all of the different little dots that are all the institutions in the state so that there is some sort of logic and ability to move between them. Um, I would say that um, one of the biggest gaps though is between K-12 and post-secondary, and that is not within the HEX purview. Um, but if uh, maybe in some other world, uh, we can connect that dot a little bit better as well. But it's that coordinating function that I think um, we need the most help with um, most days. Thank you, President Powell. President Peters. I agree with Jessica, that notion of coordinating. And as someone who's relatively new to this role in Oregon, I've been here not quite two years, maybe a year and eight months. Um, I think the short answer for me is that HEC should work to ensure that Oregon has the strongest higher educational system in the country. And of course, that really is built around the access that Senator Dimbro speaks about is, is a big part of that. But what I feel like I have lacked is really that notion of connection across higher education in Oregon, facilitated by an entity like HEC. So instead of just resource allocation and reporting and looking at data, which is important, I think there needs to be a lot of human element of bringing together leaders of institutions to actually draw on our strength of human beings who all agree that higher education is important to solve some of these issues. I think it feels still feels very siloed at times, and I think we're kind of um, missing out on an opportunity. And I think related to that, we can't ignore the fact that HEC in some ways is a political entity that reports to a governor. And so I think lots of ideas about higher education then suddenly shift and those messages are imparted in different ways by different people at different times. Thank you, President Peters. And thank you all for your very thoughtful response to that question. I'm going to go ahead and pose our second question. Uh, what do you believe are the most significant challenges over the next three years? And Colleen will put that question in the chat for you by reference. President Howard. Yes, I think uh, one of the greatest challenges is what's happened um, in the past five years because of the pandemic. I think we're dealing with learning loss and maturity, um, stunt, stunted maturity in our young people. And I think the mental health challenges also loom large. I think they're all uh, kind of mixed together. And um, I cannot help but think that that is not a huge challenge from the classroom to from the admissions office to the classroom to um, what it means to actually complete. So to me, it's a it's a moment in time um, significant problem. So I would put that uh, high on the list. I also think that um, the combination of the demographic cliff and the increasing um, just competition out there among entities that are online and who knows what else, um, sometimes not very well regulated that are coming from else, elsewhere. I think with AI in the mix, um, I think if we're not careful, we're, we're gonna all be so threatened and concerned that um, we do even less of what we need to do together for our local people. 
Uh, so there, there's just, it's kind of like a perfect storm um, in terms of just operating your business and trying to anticipate next next steps. And in the, in the midst of this, you have a lot of young people who don't want to go to school anymore. And, um, and a lot of faculty scratching their heads about how to handle the classroom. I realize I've probably put everything in the world into this, into the answer to this question, but I really think it means that we need to do more together, as Dr. Peters mentioned, um, to try to address the larger, pretty large, you know, pretty significant challenges that we are all going to be experiencing. Thank you, President Howard. Senator Denver. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, here, here I'll speak as a legislator. Um, we are putting a lot of resources into our behavioral health system, into um, you know dealing with addictions, uh, um, looking at a number of areas that are the implementation. The use of those dollars has really been very slow uh, in many cases because there hasn't been the workforce to do the work, whether we're talking about, you know, therapists, social workers, nurses, educators. We, we're, we're seeing, you know, a dramatic shortfall in, in employment. And, you know, part of the problem also that I, I foresee in the near future related to this is that, um, we, we're expecting fewer people to be moving to Oregon in the coming years, and we have really benefited by attracting a number of already educated uh, workers into the state, you know, as uh, professionals, as educators. You know, right now, fewer than half of Oregon's teachers are actually trained here in Oregon. Um, you know, and and that is uh, that is problematic. Um, I think. This goes back to the coordination issue. You know, I really think that we need, and the heck could really play a role here, uh, to have a coordinated strategic vision on, you know, how to address things like our educator workforce, like our behavioral health workforce. You know, just recently, um, you know, I was pleased that the legislature was able to give money to um, uh, the technical and regional universities in Portland State to um, to help them with their behavioral health programs to help stand up uh, master's level programs. That's where we're seeing a real shortage and that's great. Uh, but, you know, then, you know, at the last minute, one of the community colleges came forward through their legislature and, you know, they uh, said, well, what about us? And, you know, my my answer to them was that, you know, this is something the university has been working on for a while now, and so should you guys have been. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that also extends, of course, to the non-academic workforce sector. I mean, we, we really need to be looking at these challenges in a big strategic manner. And the heck is potentially at the heart of it if they can stand up and, and take that role. Um, and then of course we have to give them the capacity to be able to do it. Uh, but I, I really see that as, as very key. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, one of the other challenges is we just need to be getting more resources into our higher education, our post-secondary system. Um, you know, we, um, we have benefited uh, from doing some things using one-time COVID dollars. You know, and there I'm thinking of Future Ready Oregon Duncan, you know, a, a big success, I think, for the heck. But um, we uh, we need to find ways to uh, fund those in an ongoing manner. And that will absolutely require all the sectors to pull together and um, figuring it, figure that out, figure out how to get those resources. Thank you, Senator Denver. David? Sure, and I think pieces of what I was going to raise have already been addressed. I do see demographic kind of issues as a challenge in a couple of ways. One, the workforce issues that Senator Dembro just spoke about. Um, and it, in some ways, I think there's both uh, almost a, a devaluing of higher education societally in some areas, um, and at the same time, a lack of respect um, 
or appreciation of the opportunities for the non um, for, for the trade oriented, more um, focused educational opportunities. And I think we're missing out a lot there. Um, key to, to what I see as a challenge is getting access to people. And I think a lot of that is around knowledge for potential students about what the opportunities are. Um, and, and I think that can go a long way towards combating those kind of um, preconceptions about what higher education is. But then I think there's a that coordinating part that's been talked about is really challenging because there are so many barriers to access, whether it's um, child care, uh, housing, um, the COVID issues that President Howard mentioned that, that have far reaching impacts, um, and then even some of the um, legal challenges that are out there around the, the necessary efforts to really make systems more accessible to people that face more barriers. So I, I it sounds daunting to say, but I, I see those kind of combining to be a pretty um, challenging set of things. I do think that because there are so many different factors, that coordination piece gets really difficult. I know on the more workforce oriented side, there are just so many different different players, different funding streams, different good programs, but having them work together optimally without a lot of either redundancy or lack of coordination and, and efficiency is, is just a really difficult thing to do. Thank you, David. Melissa. Sorry, I'm not too familiar with Teams. Um, I think, and I would agree with so much of what everything of what's being said here, obviously coming from a different perspective, being in the trade world on our side and working with the heck in a different kind of capacity. Um, I think as we look at the question, what's, you know, in the next couple of years, what are some of the challenges that we are seeing? Um, I think most of it involves enrollments, people being a bit wanting to enroll, um, the mental health issues, certainly uh, anxiety ridden students, very, um, they like focus on shorter term programs, programs that, that, that are hybrid, programs that can be done some in class, some online. Um, we also seen a change in, um, you know, what their affordability. So financially, we've got programs, especially in the private uh, career schools that will be significantly, you know, range of pricing. And it's making sure that I think the HEC has done a wonderful job of making sure that the students are uh, protected and that they, in terms of enrollment agreements and admissions and those kinds of things, we also work with them on curriculum. Um, I think what'll be important is to really define the HEX role and not getting too, there's a lot of things that need to be done, but what can they do within their scope without getting them too overwhelmed with so many things? And um, I'm always a big advocate for the HEC to focus in on their their um, purview and sometimes we have to say no to some things because of time or staffing or funding and so i think um, while we do look at other ways for them to have them engage we'll also have to look at ways to um, increase funding and their staffing because i've seen them working long long hours and really are passionate about what they do but there's very few of them that's what i see thank you thank you melissa president wise so um, so I'm going to the challenges and opportunities first will be about the broader environment and then we can get into the heck, I guess, in the next question. So the way I look at it is and I think that's what we've been talking about. First and foremost, the pathways we've all been talking about. We have not created pathways to the multiple myriad of jobs that are out there that are real to give people the guidance. We started that in future ready, but if you just look at the system as we have it, um, you know, from high school, even earlier through, you know, in the early adult years, we have not created those pathways and we need we need to do that. And that's a huge challenge. And we need to find pathways for working adults to to upskill themselves. And so all of that is a whole new DNA for the system. And then you add to that, as we've all been talking about, new models of delivery. 
we have to reinvent the delivery system across the continuum in K-12, higher high school in particular. By the way, if I, if I were Senator Demro, I would put the high schools under the heck rather than under K-12. We'd be a lot better off. But you're going to be gone, but we'll we'll work on the next generation. But anyway, that's, sorry, that was a total distraction. Um, so the, the pathways need to be to work on. Then, then again, as we've all talked about, as you think about the pathways, we'd have to provide mental, all the supports we're talking about. So it's really a reinvention of the way we deliver education is the challenge and the opportunity um, as we as we look to this period. And I think we are in a period where it's possible to imagine that, but it's going to take a collective vision and that you know we need to think about how we do it. And then I just would point out, as Senator Dembro mentioned, we've spent a lot more on mental health. We also put a lot more money in early in, in early childhood and daycare. The competition for dollars is intense, and the universities and community colleges are not um, high on the list of priorities right now. We have to think about that, and I think that's a challenge that facing and and how to how to address that. So those are the challenges I see. Thank you, Thank you President Wise. Guthrie, if you're, uh, I, I believe we have uh, uh, Lois DeSitter who has joined us. Are you yes, I he just promoted him. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you. Promotions. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah, the, so, check, the, checks in, the checks in the mail, Lois, for the promotion. Th thanks, Senator. I yeah. appreciate it. Uh, no, um, and, and I appreciate this time and to speak with you all. And I'm sorry I was a little bit late. I had the wrong time here. Um, but um, I just kind of like I wanted to raise up a couple of things that I've heard both from the center and just now from um, Duncan. The um, like how. You know, how heck actually does its coordinating part of it? I do think that there is a severe lack of statewide cohesion within the system. I like I, local control is important for a lot of reasons, but it does re lead to individualism and duplication of work. And and that lack of coordination ends up doing things like, you know, Duncan's talking about how do we better create these streams into into the workforce that can't happen when everybody's trying to create a new program to get that one student to um, to get that one extra point of FTE from the CCSF or the PUSF, right? And that's the system that we have created of competition and individualism that um, that is hard. So like, I, I do believe that, you know, there is an opportunity here to raise the scope of what the heck does and kind of raise their ability to both engage with and kind of direct the work of our public institutions to help make sure that, you know, either they're helping create those pathways or they're making sure that there isn't duplicative work happening amongst the different institutions that can share some of that work. Um, and um, and I think that that both that kind of challenge and that opportunity are the two things that I'm looking at um, over the over the next couple of years. Lois, and, and uh, would you mind just saying your for those that may not know you, they may all everyone may know you, oh, but sure. your role and your description and for your relationship to the HEC? Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Louis DeSitter. I work for the Oregon Education Association, which represents staff and faculty at 11 of the community colleges. And um, uh, my relationship with the HEC is largely political. And, um, and I just want to uh, note that we're joined by Terry Cross as well, um, recent chair of the HEC. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pose our third question. Uh, what are the top three things that the heck can do to increase educational attainment for learners in Oregon? I'd like to get it started. I, I think as we've been talking about all the different types of barriers and that coordinating function, um, a key thing to be successful will be identifying the connection points from what is within scope for HEC 
Um, so if, if we don't move the high schools over, um, that's clearly a key point and communicating back to the high school system what is needed, how to engage with that system. The same with things that are clearly not going to be in scope, whether it's housing or behavioral health, child care, all of those things that are real issues that students and potential students face. Um, I think there have to be really a, a, a good way to identify which barriers individuals are facing and not not solve them itself, but to make it really easy for those people to know where possible resources are and strategies are and to communicate out to those systems or groups that do help with those barriers, what the need is and how they can better target the students and potential students. Um, I, I think that's the one thing that comes to mind is probably being the most impactful from the how we engage with HEC. Thank you, David. Senator Denbro. Um, yeah, let me say first, going back to um, the coordinating work and trying to remove those silos, um, I do think that um, we could be doing a much better job of bringing the, um, the college, individual college board members and the university board members and the HEC board members, uh, and I would add the State Board of Education members together on a regular basis to see that they have, um, you know, common interests. That we need them all working together in creating a, a common a common vision, uh, and that that's something that we had. Um, hope to see start this year. I'm not sure that it, it has, but that was part of the direction that the legislature gave to the HEC. And I think it's really important. Um, I, I think that, you know, going back to uh, David's point and, and, and Duncan's about, you know, the need to make that high school to college or training transition more you know, more robust. Uh, that is an area that Oregon really, I think, falls short on. And one of the recent um, one of the recent legislative directives, actually, it hasn't been signed yet, but it uh, we are the legislature is um, uh, asking the heck to really very seriously pursue the notion of direct admission uh, for our high school seniors so that you know, and the vision is that every high school senior will be reached out to and, you know, will be told, you know, you are admitted to your local community college, uh, depending on your um, grade point average and, you know, your course preparation, uh, you are automatically um, admitted to one of the regional technical universities. And, um, you know, depending on your background, perhaps one of the uh, comprehensives. And so every every student will be reached out to and will ideally be put on a path. And I will add to that that last year we created a new high school requirement, which is one for future planning. And uh, every high school senior or or you know certainly before they graduate they will have to have taken a one semester course in future planning and i'm not sure what role the heck has been playing in helping to design that course but i think it's going to be obviously crucial it, it's a real opportunity for us uh, to help students to get onto that path thank you senator Denver. Professor, uh, sorry president peters Sure. Um, questions like this are often fascinating because we we sort of already know a lot of the things that work in higher education, but we just don't do them. So we could point to things like we know that really good summer bridge programs for students who are at risk work and, and lead to higher retention and completion rates. We know that lower cap sizes in writing courses and early math courses if you lower those caps and have quality instruction, we know that that works. But what we don't always do is fund a university in a way 
that they can supply these solutions that we that we know work. So we sit around and ask each other, well, what could we do? What could we do? And it's kind of comical in a way. To, I, you said to be bold and brutally honest. It's kind of comical because we we um, we just don't want to say we know how to do some things and here's the money to do it. So instead, we wonder about how we might innovate. And now we're in a in a moment, and some of you have already mentioned this, where we need to really embrace the ways that we use technology productively to flex education so the students have quality experiences in a classroom, out of a classroom, and hybrid, and so that they can move seamlessly through those worlds. So um, that takes a massive amount of capital infusion to train faculty, to get this, the tech up, and to shift a culture in how education is delivered. So what could the heck do? I mean, there's simple answers. We could lower the cost of education for the citizens of Oregon. We could fund universities to take these innovative and often old steps that we know are productive and hold them accountable to do it. And I think there's nothing wrong with saying, well, here's money to really make your online learning platform work well. But you got to show us that that's what you're using it for and that's how you're doing it. So I, I will cease my rant. Thank you, President Peters. President Howard. Yes, I love the rant, oh, Jesse, very, yes, very much. Yes, um, you know, uh, uh, so many things have been said that are wonderful. I would add a couple things I haven't really heard, and that is, um, you know, Oregon is not a transfer friendly state. Um, we don't transfer well between higher education institutions. So other states are, and it's, uh, and we've been talking about this since you know the 1980s or something. And I think there's a ton of work going into this. But what's what's happening is um, that we're ending up with solutions that are almost as convoluted as the problem was at the beginning. So transfer between community colleges, transfer from community colleges to universities and between universities. Uh, an institution like Chemeketa does not have a single transfer partner. We have a number of prime transfer partners just because of our location and their location and relationship to us. I think that is low hanging fruit. And um, it's just it just seems like um, it's just not something we're able to do. And it's it's sorely vexing. So that would be number one. Number two, financial aid. You know, one of the great, amazing things about Future Ready Oregon is that it is paying people that what they would normally be not only paying to do the training, but it's paying for childcare, it's paying for lost wages, it's paying for transportation. It is actually realistically understanding what it takes to, to uh, remove a working adult from his or her job and putting them into a training program and the outstanding effects of that. I cannot even begin to tell you uh, what Future Ready Oregon has produced for working adults, but as soon as that funding goes away, it's uh, we're not going to have the financial aid. So this heck has financial aid, the OSAC underneath that umbrella. Um, and I'm just wondering that other states also have some really innovative ways to address that particular problem. For instance, when um, basically asking, for instance, a community college to cover the tuition for a student, and then after they are gainfully employed for a certain number of months, the state reimburses the community college. So it is um, things like that. It's a totally different approach to funding. Um, I think if we're not, if we don't get a lot more um, savvy around workforce, we're gonna we're gonna fall way behind. So uh, financial aid transfer, and then um, the other thing I would say is one of the big uh, opportunities ahead of us in terms of uh, again thinking about the working adult and also thinking about. Um, uh, all the reasons why students aren't coming to us is competency-based uh, education. That's very, very expensive uh, to actually manage. And so if someone comes in and wants to have credit for what they've learned to do, it, it costs us a lot to be able to, fig to, to adequately assess that. And that is one of those key features in terms of understanding how to go from, for instance, non-credit to credit through a competency a bridge. And that's just one of those things where we know it works, we know it's important, and we're we're not funding it. So those are some things, just some gaps I thought I'd fill in. Thank you, President Howard. President Wise. Duncan, are you you're on mute. Duncan, you're on mute. 
So first of all, I hope Jesse and Jessica spend a lot of time talking with each other. You two are amazing and you're really nearby. So you guys could figure a lot of this out. And I, I, I just laughed. I see Terry there. Hello, Terry. When we talk about competency based in Western's done an unbelievable job in that arena over the years. And we spent a lot of time with the heck uh, trying to sort it out. So anyway, um, but um, I think heck, I again, I've served eight years with Terry and um, have a, a very good view of, of it, what we have accomplished in terms of getting a framework. The big thing I would say about the framework that is really important, and this is where I think I disagree with you, Jesse, is the heck should not be funding individual programs of schools. It should be funding outcomes and let you innovate to get those outcomes. And I understand your the direction. It's very easy to say this works and we're going to fund you to do this. But what we really need in the whole theory of the heck, in my opinion, is we need innovation. And innovation happens locally. You need to be funded. You need to be funded well with outcomes and expectations. But I don't think the heck should be specifically naming programs. It should, however, be be building up the pathways, competency pathways to help move help students move from one place to another. So if I were looking ahead for the next period, and we're at the 10 year anniversary for the next 10 years, two things, three things. First of all, um, HEC has an extraordinary data responsibility and you know with the employment department the reality is the longitudinal data system rests with the HEC and that longitudinal data system starts at birth and we need to do a whole lot better job in explaining how folks are moving through the system we don't do that well at all and every legislator should know how many people went from you know, from senior year in high school on to a two, four year degree, all that should be utterly transparent by race, by high school. That is all possible to do. And we ought to know where people are going after they graduate, where they're employed, where they're employed, how much they're making. All that is knowable and we need to do it. And that will provide the basis for a really much stronger strategic planning function at the heck, which is the second piece that they really need to do well. I think the big need for the next 10 years is to better connect education with industry. And this is what we started with Future Ready. And Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think we're making headway. But from my world, what I've been saying to my members and to business in general is we are not organized to, to communicate effectively with, with education. We just aren't. And, and example I'll use, um, Semiconductor, where we've had huge success in the recent years, but um, in the last two years, but getting them, getting the industry organized to really communicate what they need is really hard because they're not. And so we need to, so we're going to start doing that, but then we need partners in education to listen comprehensively to those needs and respond to them and build the pathways. And so I believe we're going to have to have a completely different set of relationships between industry and educators. And the heck is the place where that conversation can come together. Um, it started with Future Ready and they've got a small, fantastic team there where we just finished a higher ed, a semiconductor assessment with the heck and that was that's going well. But this is the future. If we, industry isn't explaining what they need and then we translate those needs into policy agendas, budget agendas, mapping agendas, um, we're not going to get where we want to go. And that to me is the big opportunity for the heck to build. It's the last 10 years, we have not had a really a talent development strategy for industry in any real serious way. I think that's the big next move to do that because that will provide the pathways. And as heck does that, it needs to be bold. And frankly, it needs to view itself as the center of that conversation. It needs to map back to K-12. It needs to map back to the social service agencies and all that so that they can make sure the resources are there to put the whole package together. So I see the heck as at the center of the talent development system. And again, I think Future Ready started that, but we are embryonic in terms of that vision, embryonic. So there's a lot of work to do in the next 10 years. Um, but if we do it, it will make Oregon the leading state, in my opinion, in terms of talent development. So you want to bold, that's what I would do. And then the funding, the only final thing is getting really adept at using funding strategically without micromanaging the schools. That's my, that's what I would disagree with, Jesse. We should not be telling schools what to do with specifics because that will that will impede innovation and get absolutely in the way. So, but 
but, but accountability, yes, but not micromanagement. All right, I'll stop. Sorry to be so winded. Thank you. Lewis. Um, I'm just going to start by saying I don't think President Peters, I've never heard a president say, um, please micromanage me on the money. Um, and, and I'm actually going to push back and say that that's kind of what we should do to a certain extent. I um, Like if you're talking about current tools available, I think President Howard brought up a really important one, which is the ability for people to transfer. We're trying to do that with the common course numbering system that we're working on right now, but there's no accountability to the institutions and heck doesn't have the power to do that. And so you're talking about tools that they need. I've heard a lot of people here say accountability. Heck does need the ability to hold institutions accountable. Um, and and that, that needs to be meaningful accountability. And yes, I do think that that means to a certain extent directing some of their program to make sure that they are using best practices. I'll say that we see this in education across the board from pre-K through higher education. And there is a sense of like hands off, like give us the money, hands off. And that's not going to work anymore. Like if we as a as a as a community of higher education want to see meaningful investment, we have to prove that it's actually working and we have to be able to allow ourselves to be held accountable. So like we need real accountability at the state at the state to um, hold us um, to hold institutions accountable. Um, we um, and but I do agree with Duncan that the heck needs to have the tools to be able to help drive development and help direct like convene those conversations. But then I actually do think that like, yes, innovation happens at a local level, but I also think that it can be directed at by a higher level um, because I do think that this is where we get crosswise, where somebody gets a good idea at a local level. They have one like relationship and they try to build a program around that, but somebody down the road is doing it too. And we just need to have better coordination in that sense to be able to um, to be able to drive students to where they need to go to be able to be successful. Thank you. Hi, Terry. I see Good. you, and I, I don't think you had a chance to introduce yourself before. Would you mind just briefly saying uh, your organization you're affiliated with? Yes, I'm uh, Terry Cross. I am the founder and senior advisor at the National Indian Child Welfare Association. And until about a month ago, I was had served on the HEC for a little more than eight years and was the chair for the last two years. So um, I one of the things that I wanted to address and it uh, it touches on, on just about everything that people have talked about so far, and it's the public perception of higher education. It, it, it's across the country, but particularly here in Oregon. And there is no it, seeming no place currently for um, uh, a, an, a, a concerted effort, a coordinated collaborative effort to raise public awareness and the public profile of the value of higher education. And I think the heck has the data to do that. I, I you know, I, having served for eight years on the heck, when I would have conversations with people out in the community, um, they would say, "What the heck is that?" You know, it, they just don't know that it exists, um, and therefore there's not a clear communication. And I don't know um, whether it is something uh, that is the hex role um, to execute, but perhaps it is the hex role to convene the thinking about how do we raise the profile um, of higher education in Oregon? And, you know, I, um, it's uh, in order to change public opinion pub or public perception, you need a social marketing campaign. Uh, you need a constant uh, communications uh, platform that um, gets the the best uh, news out. Almost always when we hear news of higher education in the media, it's something that went wrong or something that's uh, there's some shortage of something or somebody didn't have a success and um, and I, you know, having dealt with uh, some of uh, the uh, media um, in my. Oh, 
Terry, you muted. You're muted. Sorry, bumped the wrong button. I guess I got too excited. Um, I I I didn't hear the um, uh, the public service announcements or the um, uh, clear um, communication of the good news. I, each I believe each institution does a great job of marketing itself. But we don't have a concerted effort across the state to tell the story of how uh, how important higher education is in Oregon. Thank you, Senator Denbro. Yeah, thanks. Actually, if I'd been quicker on the draw, I would have said almost everything that Terry did. Um, you know, we've been kind of talking about the sort of organizational uh, responsibility, and I, I think that you know the the need for the legislature to be appropriating more dollars for higher ed, which I think is absolutely true. But, um, you know, I and my colleagues uh, in the in in the legislature are driven by what the state considers to be a priority. And, you know, we're we're doing a lot of investments in housing and in addictions and in child care. Um, but um, and, and a few years ago, we did really a dramatic revolutionary increase in the corporate tax for the K-12 Student Success Act. You know, at that time, there were some of us, and, and actually I would include the governor, you know, who wanted higher ed to be included in that uh, corporate activities tax. But there was not that sense of urgency around the state. I would say, and I would say I would also kind of include here uh, the faculty and staff at our colleges and universities where, you know, often when you see the, you know, I'm thinking of the transfer work uh, where we have had some, you know, some uh, disagreements between the universities and the community colleges um, where the, you know, I think the college and university leaders have been channeling their staff who want, you know, who see the world their way and they want to make sure that uh, their own um, uh, prerogatives are respected. And, you know, I definitely sympathize with that. But at the same time, we all need to buy into this notion that we're thinking of all of Oregonians and what's going to work for them as they're moving along their pathways uh, to success. And somehow, yeah, we we just need a lot of boosterism, I think. And we can't lay all that all of that on the heck, but the heck can be sort of a central point that everyone can be working towards. And and just finally, you know, I would also rope into it, you know, as um, Duncan mentioned, the need for business and industry to be in that conversation and be among those boosters and strongly advocating that need. The reason we were able to put money into semiconductors is because there was a big push for that and, you know, as well as some federal resources. And those are the kinds of packages we need to be putting together. Thank you. And President Wise, I think given our time, you might have our last comment for the day. Oh, well, I didn't, I wasn't, didn't have anything so profound to say. That'd be the last. <laughs> so so I, it's not lost on me, Lewis, that we have, you know, you're arguing for more accountability. It sounded like than I am, but I actually don't think that's quite true. Um, but, but the big, the big thing I would say is for the heck that I, I, I think we're all talking about is the role of the heck of convening across systems include and really playing that role way more. And I think getting tighter with the universities and community college presidents and K-12 and businessmen and other groups. But that will require a level of convening that Terry, I think we know just has, has not existed. And I think it would be really valuable because one of the things that I, I was a member of the frustrated by the sense of animosity among the the presidents in the heck and it's like what are we doing we're all on the same team here folks let's and include and then the animosity frankly we heard from students complaining about the administration and the universities around tuition increases and things we got to be on the same team <laughs> and that means having a lot more conversation and dialogue and designing these pathways 
that makes sense that I think we all want to create. And that I don't think you're going to be doing that by, you know, on high prescriptive action, but it's going to be by collaborative work together. And I don't know how to do that. It's a lot of resource, but we need to do a lot more of that. And I think that's a critical role for the heck going forward. Thank you. And we have probably just uh, just a couple more minutes. If anyone would like to share any final thoughts, anything that you would like us to know before we end our time together today, this hour went by so quickly. I just want to thank everyone for your participation and engagement. But is there anyone that would like to share, just share a final thought before we close out for the day? President Peters. You're muted. President, President Peters, you're muted. I wanted to go through the whole day without someone saying I was muted. But anyway, um, I, I think I would summarize by saying that we need to seed innovation. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is a collaborative approach among human beings who are leading in this world. And then I do agree that there, there does need to be accountability. And I think we need to strike that balance between micromanaging oversight and prescriptive innovation and true innovation from people within higher education that then need to prove that there are results that we want in Oregon. So how we get there is difficult, but you know, just like anything, I think it, it requires um, a champion and it requires a lot of collaboration. And when those things happen, you see results. Thank you. And we are just uh, about at time. I want to thank everyone again today for joining us in this focus group. Really tremendous insights that you all provided today. Um, Beth, I'm not sure if there's anything else you want to share about the process or how people can share additional information. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Uh, I'll just note that we have extended the deadline for our anonymous uh, survey in relation to this uh, effort. So that'll be open through uh, next Wednesday, the 20th. Uh, if you haven't already uh, submitted a response there, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about it. All right. Well, thank you all again for your time today. I uh, wish you a very good afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. And thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Yep. Good to thank see you. you all.